John. Say, Pastor John, you got you have a sermon on reserve over because <laughs> not in that coming. I don't have I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I can say. But the Lord reminded me again of a word that I got that same Sunday in church in the back there. I spent more time than I like sitting at the back because guess what? I don't know when you come to church, when you come to church, you do. But when I come to church, it's because I realize the goodness of God to me. So sometimes I feel like if I'm in front and I'm dancing and really carrying on, I can distract some people. So I, I prefer to stay at the back where I can carry on the most ways. Because I think sometimes, some, some of the reason why some of us come and we sit still and we don't raise our hands and, and we, don't, we don't really listen to, to the move of the Holy Spirit is because we are afraid what others may think of us. I'm going to encourage you, when you come to church from now on, you don't care, you got business for nobody else want to think. You are here because of the goodness and the mercy of God to you. You know what it is that you are believing God for. And I'm telling you, in this dispensation, pastor has been preaching about this for the last two years, talking about God will do something in, in his house. And I'm telling you, he's getting ready. It's already done. It just needs to be manifested. The ground has been ready, it just needs to be manifested. But what is going to make that manifestation come quicker is the obedience of you and I. Go back to the Pocahontas church. I don't know too much about the church because by the time I, I was born, it was in ruins. But what I understand is that sometimes you go to these kind of, I guess, the revivalist church. I just see these people, they're running up and down, and they're going on and doing the most. But some of them, again, who am I to judge them on? But all I'm going to say is sometimes, God requires to run. Yeah. Require literally to run around the sanctuary. Yeah. Because there needs to be some clearing. Yeah. But again, because you and I are not used to these things, when somebody else do it, we're like, yo, she need to extra, you need to extra. But sometimes it's the extra you need to be delivered to come. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes the mascara has to run. Sometimes you've got to look like a whole clown when you've done the worship. Because that is what's needed for the deli deliverance to come. Pride has laid hold on a lot of her hearts for too long. Alright, let's go. Let's go to this. Let's go to this. <laughs> Alright. So the definition of the word promise. And again, this morning is not supposed to be a sermon. And I try and preach. This is, this is something I think in the, in the last few months I've become very clear on. God has given me certain giftings. And I'm also learning how to operate in those giftings. And how not to allow the, I guess what people say my gift things are, box me in. Right, right. So today, it's not a sermon, it's just something that God share with me, I share with you. If it hits you like a sermon, then that, that you're in God's business. But for me, and for my own sanity, I just share with you what God has shared with me. The definition of the word promise. What does promise mean? It you Sunday, so we're gonna do it like you group. What does promise mean? When you tell someone you're going to do something and do it exactly. According to Google, it is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that particular thing will happen. As a verb, it means to assure someone that um, one will do, give, arrange, or um, undertake or declare that something will happen. So now that we're in youth group Sunday, please make sure you have a pen and a paper because it's going to be very useful. Um, for you to have a pen and a paper, maybe if you don't have a pen and a paper, I will, I will excuse you to use your phone notes, but please do not be on WhatsApp or Facebook or Instagram. When we talk about promises, I know like, growing up in primary school, we used to do like pinky promises. Okay, tell me how a pinky promise works. Yeah. Put it back. Okay, so so your hands up. What do you want to say? Speak loudly.
listen. She added on to what Pastor Tonya said and she, she closed it off very well. In the book, All the Promises of the Bible, the author Herbert Locklear found that there are over 7,000 promises from God to man in the Bible. That's just one person's count, right? Yet this morning, I want us to think about the promises that God has made to us. So here's my question to you, and this is where your pen and paper comes in. How many of us have a promise that God has made to us? Can you think of that promise or promises now? Yeah. yeah. Now I want you to write it down. Whatever that promise is, whatever you believe God has promised, you write it down so you can see them black away. Write it down. When you write it down, say amen. Amen. Hey, amen over here. I don't hear amen too over here. Y'all got it? I didn't hear amen much. <laughs> All right. Look at the promise you've just written down. And if you haven't, there's still time. Just write it down. I want you then to ask yourself honestly and answer yes or no. So next to the promise, you don't put yes or no. Concerning this promise or these promises, do you really trust that God will do what he says that he's going to do for you? And be honest, nobody can see it. And, and the reason why I'm asking you this is because sometimes we say yes, but then our actions, our words. So as you're answering that, make sure it's lining up. If you're going to be honest with yourself, and this is no um, damnation or co condemnation towards you. It's just, a, a, I guess I would say, a moment for you to honestly reflect. If God has said he's going to do something for you, do you really believe it? And how you know you believe it is does your actions and your words match up? When looking at an, an example for a promise in the Bible, the first one that came to mind was the promise that God made with Noah. Genesis 9, 8 to 17 in Amplified reads, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I am establishing my covenant, binding agreement, solemn promise, with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, the wild animals of the earth, along with you, of everything that comes out of the earth, every living creature of the earth. So we see that God is establishing a promise, not just with Noah. Who else, who else is he establishing a promise with? His sons. His sons? Make you your hand up. Who else? Okay. Who else? After that, the animals, the creatures, yeah? I'll teach you, and you, please answer me back when I ask the question. Thank you. I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall flesh be cut off by the water or the flood, nor shall there be ever again be a flood to destroy and ruin the earth. And then God said, This is the token, a visible symbol, memorial of the solemn covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. What was that, that, that token, that symbol? Rainbow. The rainbow. And again, boy, but when I see the rainbow every single time, it's a reminder to me that God is faithful and he's true. Amen. Amen. There is something that I can see, tangible form, that tells me if God can make that promise to Noah from Wapakil Full Up way back then, and we can still see the rainbow today. How can I dare think anything that will come true for me? What are some characteristics of a promise? A promise is intentional. There's a problem or there's a situation and it aims to either solve that problem or provide for a specific circumstance or situation. A promise is also personal. It is made with you. That, pro that promise can also have a reach on you personally, meaning that the rainbow with Noah, that's a promise that God made with Noah. But then by extension, that's a promise that you and I partake in. Amen? Amen. There's always a witness. There's something that we can see. Something that we can... So in, in, in modern day times, it's a pinky... 
I guess in, in primary schools, it's the pinky fingers, it's a contract, it's a, there's, there's something that, that bears witness that this promise has been made. And then there's a clear end product. Y'all agree? A promise worth its weight in gold needs to be secured. We need to believe that the person or whoever has promised this to us can carry it out. When that promise is challenged by the circumstances of life, our response is always then to go back to the word of God. So when we think about the promises that God has made, the promises that you have written down, when, when life brings situations up to you and you start to think and believe, okay, well, I don't understand, Lord. You said you want to do this, but my God, I've been waiting for so long. Your responsibility is then to go back to the word of God. Yeah? yeah? We have a confidence that no matter what the promise is, it will come to pass. Yeah. I was thinking about this, the Lord brought me, through to, brought me to Abraham. And even as I was preparing this, this message, I realized that there are specific things that God has been saying over the past couple of weeks, and then he just brought it all together. So if you look at Genesis 15, you have your Bibles, turn with me. You should have your Bibles because you cannot come to war without your weapon. Verse 1. It reads, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, to Abram, sorry, in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. God shows up to you and said, hey, fear not. I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. But Abram says to him, oh Lord God. I guess I can paraphrase. I don't understand. What, 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 what would my reward be? I don't even have a child. God says to him, you jump down to verse 4. Because mm -hmm. at this point, Abraham is thinking that um, Eliezer of Damascus is going to be his heir. Right? And God says to him, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And then look what God did. So talking about one, it was intentional, it was personal, but then there's always a witness, some kind of, some kind of vision, some kind of, uh, I guess, um, rep, point of reference that, that you can make to remember whatever the promise is. God says to him, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to them, to him, so shall your offspring be. And the word of God says, and he believed the Lord and he was counted to him righteousness. So we see that here you have this man called Abram, mighty man of God. God comes, God gives him a promise. But Abraham's like, I'm not really sure about the promise. And the Lord says, actually, yes, this is how I'm going to do it. God promised him to give him offspring as, as a number of the stars in the sky. The Lord, the word of the Lord says that because he believed, it was counted to him as righteousness. But there was a problem. Who knows what the problem was? He was old. He was old. So, so, so was Sarah. Sarah. Sarah was barren. Okay, yeah. These are all these are all for the reason. Anybody else want to add? Yeah? Okay, moving on. But I posit to you that the problem was that his current name was limiting the ability for the promise to come to pass. Abraham then exalted father. So if God had said, you know what, I'm gonna make you a great father, cool, promise done. But God said to him, no, actually, I'm going to make you, I'm, I'm going to make you have <clears throat> offspring as much as, 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 far as, you, as far as you can see the stars. And I know you can't number them. I'm going to give you offspring that much. But his name was Exalted Father. Jump over with me to verse, up uh, to chapter 17.
When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to, sorry, I keep saying, see, I'm jumping forward. When Abram was 99 years old, the, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham, then Abraham fell on his face and said to God, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. In order for the promise, and again, this is, this is what I believe the Lord has shown me, in order for the promise to take full effect, God had to change his name. It had to be a renaming uh, ceremony. So much so that even when other people spoke his name, they spoke the promise. And I believe if you're willing to open your heart to hear this, I believe some of us are not seeing the fulfillment of the promise of God in our lives because there needs to be a renaming taking place in the spirit of God. Some of us were walking around, yes, with names given to us by our parents, but also attached to those names are various generational things, too. Lord, help me. The very utterance of our name goes against what the Lord has said about you. I challenge you to set aside some time and go before God. And ask it, what is the declaration in heaven about you? And the only reason I can tell you this is because I had to do that. And I feel like once God told me what heaven declared about me, I was able to start walking different. I could see myself in a different light. Everybody else could tell me and say, oh my goodness, you're, 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 you're going to do great things. You know, the call of God is on your life. But somehow... Somehow, I didn't have the revelation of what God said I was. And because that revelation was missing, it made it hard for me to truly believe what everybody else was saying. Y'all quiet. Is that because y'all hearing it? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> So now we're going to go to this part where I'm calling the journey to making a cake. So as I said, I almost called Pastor Sean and be like, Pastor, I, I even checked the preaching schedule like three times. Like, is my name down? Because God, I don't hear you say nothing. Like, am I supposed to? You sure I'm supposed to preach it or speak it? But as I laid in my bed yesterday, and I, was, and, and I felt like over this past weekend, I don't know about you guys, but I've just been very tired. Like, I just feel super worn out, just tired, tired. So I've been, after we had our strategic planning meeting, I went to sleep and I just slept. I was like, God, I haven't written one word on paper. I don't understand, but I tired. So I slept. But then, when I woke up, I laid in bed for a little bit, and you know, I was flipping through, putting on soaking music. I said, all right, God, what are you saying? Then I said, you know what, cool, let me watch like, some cartoons. Maybe that'll free up my mind. Yeah, cartoon maybe on, 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 on wine. But then I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, go bake the cake. Mind you, I bought this gluten-free pumpkin bread thing. It was in the cupboard for the last couple weeks. But I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, go bake the cake. And I was like, Lord, that's a lot of work to go bake a cake right now. I'm tired. Kept saying, go bake the cake. Next thing, one of my friends in the UK messaged me. And I'm talking, and all of a sudden, the person says, like you let that person say, hey, you the baker's daughter. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? The baker's daughter? Like, what? But that's because there's a Hebrew word, which is, I'm going to tell you, bakar, which, funny enough, B A K R, and I've been learning Arabic. And this past week, one of the words that I was, that I was learning how to see, because how the app works, you learn to see it, you learn to hear it, was bakar. So I was like, okay, God. This is the word he, the person is saying to me, bakar, which means um, to have the fur, like, I think it means to, 
to, ha to bear the first fruit, to conceive the first fruit. So I was like, okay, God, person's called me baker's daughter. And then the, the word bakar also kind of, when it's transliterated, so when it's said, can also mean baker. So that's why that, that's what, that, that's why that name came. So anyways, I got up and said, all right, this must be a sign. I don't know about you, I, I see God and everything. So I said, all right, God, this is a sign. I'm going to bake the cake. So I go get me the cake, you know, pick out a box, look at the box. And I almost like set up a whole baby thing here this morning, but I know that's too extra, I'm gonna do that. But you guys can picture in your minds. Elijah, I sent it to you, did you get it? Cool. So picture a cake box, right? So think of the cake box. See the cake box, I say, oh, the promise, the end product. It's like, all right, God. Again, following instructions, I'm gonna get eggs, I'm gonna get the water and the oil. And then it's like, the egg, the water, the oil. I was like, God, you brought me this for This must mean something. <laughs> so then I started looking and I was like, all right, let me Google quick time. Like, why is the egg important? And I realized that when it comes to the promise of baking the cake, the egg helps to bring stability. So I say, okay, God, I say, I pay people have stability. They don't understand that. What I, what I mean in spiritual terms. The egg stability is the faith, the faith that you have. So I get to the oil now. So I say, oh, Google, what does the oil do? The oil helps the cake to be moist, tender, malleable, or pliable. So if you're baking, like, uh, I guess, even like a bread or any kind of dough, it, the oil is the thing that makes it easier to kind of move around, shape, and form. So I said, okay, God, how does that translate spiritually? It says obedience. So then the water, come on, I say, okay, water. What does water mean? Why is this important? Water brings everything together. It disperses all of the ingredients. And it also provides a consistency in the dough. So I said, God, what's the spiritual significance of that? Prayer. Then we come Again, mind you, by this time, I didn't have no work to tell them this morning. I literally was going to come up here and be like, all right, um, after praise and worship, bye. That's all I want to say. <laughs> but then, like I said, man, they bring me through this baking steps. Then he's like, okay. I said, but then you have to think about the time and then the fire and the oven. And he says, that is the refining wow. that takes place. Wow. All right. So when you put all these together, so you put the cake, cake mix, you put the eggs, you put the water, you put the oil, then it goes through a refining process to get to the end product. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't believe me. Yeah. <laughs> right, right? The extreme opposite has to happen for an extreme result to take place. Before all you saw was a box. Cake. Use imagination. It's cake. The cake mix. That's, that's what you saw. In order for you to get the picture on the box, it had, if, it, if, it, if it don't go through the fire, you're not getting the cake that's on the box. The extreme opposite has to happen in order for you to get an extreme result. And the key thing is a lot of us want to be exalted to high places, but we do not want to be humble. Yet the word of God tells us that we should not despise the day of small beginnings. Amen. Amen. Then I say, okay, God, cool. Like, that is this really good, you know, illustration. Cool, all right. Um, but how? Show me like, how to make this make sense of the character. And then Andrew was my favorite character. Can you guess? <laughs> I am known as Francis the Dreamer. Who do you think my favorite character is? Thank you, Pastor Sean. Joseph. Right? So we're going we to take a deep dive. What time is it? Early? <laughs> Try something early, something early. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, look, look with me at Genesis 37. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so you know the story about Joseph. In 1 to 11, this is where the 17 year old God gives a dream, which I believe and I take as a promise to Joseph. Yeah? And let's just, okay, I guess I'll read that. Two from verse three. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of any more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Verse 5 says, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. And if you live in my household, I said to them, even bring me. Here's a look. Yeah, I dreamed. You went to last night? <laughs> but from my what? This is from what I was a girl. I had this dream, right? Can I take this? Can I get this dream before? About me dreaming that I went to the, 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 um, the Queen's Palace and how I went to use the bathroom and she came with like a platter of tissue. Like, I was like literally like maybe late, late age and dreaming that I'm going to the Queen's Palace and getting to choose different toilet papers. So I've been a dreamer all my life. Right? So I can, I can identify with Joseph. So he says, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheep in the field and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheep gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Now, if you his brothers, you see that his daughter, your daughter, his favorite. How are you feeling? Louder? <laughs> salty? Salty, yeah. And that's exactly what the Bible says. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9 says, then he dreamed another dream. So mind you, he knew that his brother, his brother's already out to have beef with him. But here he goes again, sharing another dream. Behold, I dream, behold, I, I, I have dreamed another dream. And behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. <laughs> <laughs> but when he told it to his father and to his brothers, even this time now, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and all your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? But read verse 11. And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept his saying in mind. So here, the first um, quarter of Joseph, you see, he gets these dreams, which then leads to his brothers hating him. But even when his father heard it, his father's like, you know what, this is two dreams in a row that he's saying to me that kind of, it sounds like, that, like this is how, and again, when God speaks, or in my, in, my, in my experience of God speaking, I feel like whenever God speaks, there's always a confirmation. And if God shows me something two times, something or something. Verse 18 now talks about how his brothers then decide that they're going to, you know, kill him. Imagine having your brother just trying to kill him, yeah? But in, instead, instead of killing him, they then sell him off to the Midian, Midianites. And when the Midianites um, took him, in verse 30, from chapter 37, verses 36, it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So here we go, God showing Joseph this promise, this, this, this thing that is to come in his dreams. But all has happened so far is that, you know, his brothers has hated him for it. He's ended up, you know, being thrown in a pit. His brother's plotting to kill him. Huh? It's like I said, opposite. Yes, every sign that's happening is going against the dream. Right? And now he finds himself a slave in Egypt to Potiphar. When you, go to, when you go to chapter 39, I'm not going to read all of that, but just kind of walk us through it. Here again, you see Joseph in Potiphar's part of house. So one would think, well, I am sold off as a slave, and you know, now I'm in this rich man's house, and it seems that this rich man's wife liked me, so to make my life easier, let me just do whatever this rich man's wife says, says I need to do. What did Joseph do? The exact opposite of what I just said. 
he decided that he was going to still let his faith in God stand stronger than anything else. Right? So much so that when this woman threw herself at him, he decides that, you know what, actually, I'm going to run, I'm going to flee. Potiphar came, heard it, then threw him in another prison. So now we get to Genesis 40, and in, and, in, and in the prison, there happens to be two of the king's officers. So you have the baker, which last night I was like, Lord, I am not that baker's daughter, so let's get that right. <laughs> um, so you had the baker, and then you had the cup there. So while, while they were in the prison, again, Joseph could have been like, you know what? My life is falling apart. I'm going from prison to prison. And you know what? It doesn't make sense. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna ignore everybody else. I'm not gonna try to serve or be there to help anybody else. I'm just gonna focus on me. It's gonna be my time. This is my year. I am the focus. But then we find that he's among these two, these two men who were at once at, in, in exalted positions, who now God has made a base. And they both come and they have dreams. So Joseph says to them when they come, he tells them the dream. He's like, you know what? God, I believe that I can go and pray and go before God. God will give you the answer or the interpretation for this dream. And he did just that. But after he did that, one, the baker, his interp the interpretation for his dream meant that his life would end. And the interpretation for the cupbearer's dream meant that he would be restored to his former position. And Joseph said to them, I only ask you to do one thing. When you go back to Pharaoh, remember me. That's all. So in, in his prison, he decides that he wants to serve other people. And if we're honest with ourselves, when, on our way to our promises, on our way to the things that God has, God has said he's going to do, do for us, how many of us, when the troubles start to lick us, can we truly say that we have the spirit to serve? I know if I'm being honest with myself, that's not my disposition all the time. But as I read this, it felt like a, a reminder from God that, that when you find yourself in circumstances like Sister Cassandra said, it's a complete opposite of what God has promised you. Your job is to serve until God opens the next door. We fast forward to verse 41. So chapter 41 now. So now Pharaoh is the one dreaming dreams. But then there's no one in Egypt, who can who can who can tell these the meaning behind these dreams? So in comes Joseph. Mind you, remember I think I think the Bible says it, it was after two whole years. So imagine you do something good, the cup here, get back to his position, two years, and it was just because they, and I believe it's because his life was on the line now because nobody could tell her the dream. He remembered actually, there's a boy, Joseph. He could interpret the dream. Hold on to that. There's a declaration coming for that part. And so you have it where the cupbearer remembers, tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh calls Joseph over. And here we go from the pit to being a slave to being in prison, still being in prison. And just like that, he had an audience with Pharaoh. Let's go back to our eggs, our oil, and our water. In the case of Joseph, I believe that his faith in God was what kept him stable. His obedience to do what the word of God says, even when no one was looking. Because truth be told, there, um, part of his wife threw, threw herself at him. Who would know? You know that thing about on Instagram? Who's going to know? No one's going to know. No one's going to know. He, he could have decided to, to move a different way. But he decided to be obedient to the word of God. And then you have the water, the consistency, the dispersing. Every single time that there came a time for him to, to, um, to interpret a dream, he never did it on his own back. He always said that it has to come from God. Interpretation comes from God. And how do you hear from God? Prayer, fasting, and his word. And I believe in this case, Joseph had a direct relationship where he was constantly speaking to God 
to be able to hear what God would say in these dreams. But something else stood out to me last night. When you look at verse four, um, chapter 48, verse 2, it says, at this time, this is when Joseph comes. So he goes, and in, and in an instant, you find that. No, actually, let's read that. Let's, let's, let's show that. I come into our close. <clears throat> so we find that if you read in, in chapter 41 from 37, we see that it says, This proposal pleased Pharaoh and, he, and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servant, Can we find a man like this in whom the Spirit of God? Who, who is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regard to the throne will I be greater than you. The man went from being in a pit to now running Egypt, and, and, and if, we can, if we can expand that, to be able to be a provider for the whole world. Yeah. But it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Sometimes the promise is not going to happen like, okay, God said it today, and, and then tomorrow you jump to it. Yeah. Sometimes the promise takes a while to come through. Yeah. Yeah. And just like we talked about the cake, the time and the fire, it is a refining process. Imagine, when God showed him that those dreams at 17 years old, do you believe that Joseph could have been in a position then? He would have killed him. He wasn't ready for it. Sometimes for a promise to, to take full for, for effect, you have to go through a, pro, a, 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 a process of growth. And that growth is a very stretching and strenuous pro, a, a process. And I can tell you that because I feel like in my life, I have felt what that feels like. Amen. Sometimes I remember when I came out of school, I look at my saying, oh God, I do everything you're telling me to do, but yet still I feel like I can't, I can't make no headway. I don't understand. You said that you wouldn't do this, but still nothing is happening. I don't understand or what, like what is happening. And thinking that God had, had forgotten me. Thinking that everybody else is moving forward, but here I am in my life. Lord, when am I going to see you do a move in my family where people get saved, where people understand the power of God? Amen. But realizing now that some things had to go the way they went yes. in order for me to enjoy the end result. Yeah. Yeah. What happens if you try to take a cake out over the time it's finished? It flop. It sink. It rock. Everything. It, it, it's not edible. Waste of product is not edible. And a lot of us, we're wondering why is there a stagnancy on our life? And I dare to say that it is because you're going through a process. Amen. Amen. So we have a choice. We can either fight the process or embrace the process. Amen. But as I stood here two Sundays ago, which funny enough, very same Sunday, I went and get tested and I had COVID. <laughs> like, yeah, sorry, what are you doing? Listen, the process, thank you, Candy. I sat back there, right? And as they were, uh, it was the Pastor Tonya. Yeah, just direct. I'm trying to remember who else was behind. Pastor Tonya was worshiping and leading us into worship. And I stood back there. And I felt God started to take me to a place. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what God showed me. As I stood there, it was like God took me and I was in front of his throne. And as I was in front of his throne, I saw, I knew that I was in a multitude of people, but I could not see the shape and form of the people. What I could see was, it was like I was standing off to the side, and as I was standing off to the side, what I was seeing was, I was in the middle, as I would, as I would lift my hands here in the sanctuary, I could see myself lifting my hands and worshiping. But I was in the midst of this multitude of people that it just looked like this glow, this gold glow this glory, this yellow kind of light. And then when I looked in front of me, I saw this huge stage, huge platform. And I knew I was looking at the throne of God. So much so that I knew it, like in that vision, I knew that if God stood up, the only way my, my earthly mind could understand it 
was he would be a giant to me. Because literally his entire presence, when I tell you, man, take up like stadium school. That's how big the stage was. But as I was there, and I like, came out, and like, it, and I got corn about here, let me tell you. <laughs> and when, when I came out, I heard, I heard the Spirit of God say to me two things. When that was happening, I started to see, I started to see myself in the eyes of how other people saw me. And like, you know, people saying, oh, if you ever see me driving on the road in front of the garden, don't hold it against me. Um, sometimes I'm not heavy foot. Um, <laughs> and so I can see my, this is happening in real life. I can see myself like driving and I can see people saying, oh, she's supposed to be that all your friends. She's like, what you driving on the road? Is she crazy like that for? And I can just hear them. I can just hear the spirit of God say to me, you're my daughter and I love you the same. There was a, a, a clear renouncing of anything anybody else could say, and God just reminding me that he, I was His. Just like how you, if you you know with your parents or you have a mother or father that say, "Yo, that's my child. I don't care what you want to say. He or she belongs to me." Yeah. And I feel like a lot of us we live with the shadow of what people think of us, and God wants us to know and see that what everybody else thinks doesn't matter. What matters is what God sees you as. Yeah. So even as that happened, I was like, all right, cool. Come back. When I come back now, all of a sudden, again, it's like I start hearing the, the word of God saying in my head, I am a promise keeper. No promise will I give you will it ever fall to the ground. Then I hear Pastor Tony draw up a promise keeper. I'm like, no, Lord, what are we doing? <laughs> I was like, okay, God. Well, okay, cool. I am a promise keeper. No promise will I ever give you that will fall to the ground. Clear as day. And I shared this this morning, not to show, not, not to say that this is this happened to me, but to remind you that God is a promise keeper. Yeah. No promise will He give you that will fall to the ground. Amen. After that, I said, "Okay, God." Then it felt like I was going through birth and pains. I started to groan. At one point, I had to lean up against the wall, groaning, groaning, groaning. And at the end of, at like, almost like at the end of the last push, that's when I came up here and I said what I said. The Lord said, though the vision tarries, wait for it. Though the promise tarries, wait for it. For behold, I am doing a new thing. From so we keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Our pastor is doing, and, and, is, and I believe that he's being led by the Lord God himself. I started coming out to Bible study, one, because of the prayer time. So even the Wednesday before that, I came, and after I came, again, there was a beautiful time in the presence of the Lord when we went into prayer. So much so that God gave me a dream. Again, Joseph, you see it? Dream. <laughs> and in the dream, I saw a light in this place, the place was filled with light. Like, it was almost like the sun itself somehow took up residence inside here. And then I started to see people that I, have, I hadn't seen in church for a very long time. And Pastor, Pastor Sean had a bottle of water. And it's not a cake where it comes to water. But he had a bottle of water in his dream. And he was going around pouring it on people. But as he was pouring it on people, some people were running from it. And I stood under there in the dream. And I was like, oh God, but the water symbolizes your spirit. So why are people running? And in the dream, I made a conscious, a conscious decision. I'm not gonna run. I'm gonna wait. When, when he comes pouring on me, I'm gonna wait for my turn. I'm not running from it. And he came and he poured it over me from my head, and it took the water went straight to down to my foot. And when he poured it on me, he gave me a verse, which is in the, I didn't remember what the verse was, but it was in Matthew. But I share that to say. God has been telling us that he's going to do something. Pastor Sean has come up here. Different people have come and prayed. We, we've known that God is in this house. Yes. But there is something that is required from you and me. We need to be obedient to the move of God. We can't be, even as this morning as I was driving, <clears throat> coming to church, it came to me a, a, a promise that, that, that is worth its weight in gold. It's not passive.
There has to be action. It is active. In order for us to see the move of God that we, I know a lot of you come to church on Sunday looking for, you need to decide in, in your heart to be active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we come on to church on, on a Sunday morning, we cannot expect and wait for those who are on stage just to hype us up. We need to come into this place with a praise in our heart. Amen. A lot of times God is wanting to move in this place. But because we're unwilling to be obedient, he can't move for he wants to move. Genesis 40, verse 2 says, And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then it says, Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in his bed. When the promise is taking forever to come, if you can have the mindset, if you can have the ability to see it as God has said it, there will come a time where, because maybe you think you've waited so long, you have to, you're going to have to summon your strength. Some of us are tired, spiritually and physically. But I believe God is calling us to summon our strength. The promised land is not just Canaan in the Bible. One of my friends showed me this last night. The promised land, if you're going to take it literally, is the landing of the promise. Whatever it is that God has said he's going to do for you, 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 you your ability to see that happening is your promised land. A lot of us, like I said, we're tired, we're weary. Second Peter says, one, to, one, one, three to four says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us, his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Here's the kicker. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. The Bible talks about the signs that follow them that believe. I don't know about you, but I, I look in to see people get healed. Amen. I look in to see people get delivered and stay delivered. The word says that so through them, by which he has granted us, granted to us his precious and very great promises. It is his promises that has allowed us to become partakers of his divine nature. To partake means to take part in or experience something along with others. Jesus has died for you and I to take part in the promises that he has brought about. And this great promise for you and I is the fact that Jesus died and resurrected. When we sing Rattle, I love that song because it says resurrection power now lives and runs in my veins. So when I, when I come up against a situation that does not align with what God has promised, I have the power to speak to that. To say, mountain, remove yourself. There is a promise that God has made. And some of us, the promise that you wrote down, you're still on the fence about whether or not you believe it will come to pass. But I remind you this morning, God is not a God that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he not speak and then act? Does he promise and not fulfill? 1 John 5, 7-9 says, For there are three that testify. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given to us about his son. We are quick to believe what other people say. But I will tell you, you dare to encounter the spirit of God and make the spirit of God tell you something. Listen. I declare this morning that though the promise, the vision tarries 
Wait for it. He who has promised it is faithful to see it through. Like David, like Joseph, the Lord will dispatch destiny help us to your aid. Like Joseph this morning, I command every cupbearer to remember your name. Every cupbearer will remember your name. No good deed, they say, will go unpunished. No good deed will go unrewarded. Amen. Guys, Amen. every cupbearer will remember your name. Do you realize that if the cupbearer had not remembered Joseph's name, he would not become second in command in Egypt? Father, right now I come before your throne and I command every person that's been holding up the destiny of your children, I command them to let it go in Jesus' name. Father God, I arm myself with the full arm of God. I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. My waist is girded up with the belt of truth. My feet are shod with the gospel of peace. I take up the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. And I command every cupbearer to remember your children's name this morning. Father God, every promise that you have made. Father God, I clear the highways and the byways. And Father God, I pray that you will, will let it be so in your time, mighty God. Father God, right now, Father God, for those of us who are going through the testing of the fire, Father God, for those, who, for those of us who are going through the process of time, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to summon our strength, to remember that you are faithful and you are true, to remember that no promise you will make that you cannot keep, to remember that you are God and you cannot lie, mighty God. Hallelujah. Father God, I pray that you remove every spirit of doubt and fear right now, Father God. Father God, I, I decree and I declare that by, by extension of being in the sanctuary this morning, God, that you are doing something new. That by extension of being in the sanctuary right now, God, that chains are being broken, mighty God. That minds are being set free, mighty God. Lord God, I come against every ungodly covenant, Father God, that we may have entered into. Father God, knowing you are unknowing you, Jesus. And we declare, God, that you are Lord of our lives, Father God. We pledge allegiance only to the cross. Yeah, Jesus. Father God, I pray right now that those who need healing in their bodies, mighty God, Hallelujah. that you bring healing, Jesus. Father God, I pray this morning that those who need healing in relationships, Jesus. Father God, we come against those spirits that come against marriages on this island, mighty God. And we bind it and we send it back to the pit of hell where it belongs. Jesus, we lose your children in, in this place this morning, mighty God. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Yes, Lord. Father God, help us not to shy back. Or back down from the call that you placed upon our lives this morning, God. Yes. But I pray for boldness to flood through the sanctuary, mighty God. I pray, Father God, for our freedom, for our commissioning to take place this morning, God. I pray over our pastors, Father God, Pastor Sean. Mighty God, I pray that you continue to anoint him, Father God, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Jesus, that you show us what it means to serve Father God in this house, mighty God. Father God, has he been faithful to bring forth the vision? God, help us to, to put our, our shoulders to the plow and do what we need to do, Father God. Father, we ask forgiveness for the ways that we've been disobedient, mighty God. Forgive us for our grumblings and our groanings, Jesus. Father, we just pray for an outpouring of your presence upon this place. Jesus, your spirit is here, God. Father God, we thank you that when we come into the sanctuary, that this is like Bethlehem, mighty God. Real both, mighty God. Jesus, we thank you that your angels inhabit this place, mighty God. Your angels inhabit this compound, Lord God. And for those right now, Father God, on the sound of my voice, Father, that, that may still be on the fence. That says, God, how can you love me knowing who I am? Father, I pray that you will let your love flood over them like a mighty rushing wave. Mighty God, your word says that when the enemy comes in, like of God, you will raise up a standard against him. And God, I picture that just like I picture the Red Sea parting, mighty God. The enemy coming, Father God, 
but it is you who raised up the flood against him, Jesus. So I pray right now that you back back every lie that the enemy speaks over your children, Jesus, and that you would speak life over them, mighty God. I silence every lying spirit in this place, mighty God. I cut them off right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray right now for planting to take place in your children, Jesus. A holy planting, mighty God. And I thank you for the harvest that will come forth. Father God, may they not shy back to the call that you place upon their lives, God. Father God, may they have an understanding that just because someone is good in this, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take away from what they're good at, good at, mighty God. I pray for the revelation that you will give them, Father God, that there is more than enough room at the table, mighty God. Lord. Father God, we, we pray and we speak, not, 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 not from an earthly standpoint, but we pray and we speak these things from the place that you set us, set us at, Father God. You said that you've given us a seat in high places, mighty God. Jesus, I thank you from other Frank Zone, Father God, will come gatekeepers of different industries, mighty God. Father God, within this house, God, I thank you right now that every business represented in this place is blessed to overflow. Father God, we thank you that everything we need is in the house this morning, mighty God. Jesus, I pray for those who have been sitting on the fence when it comes to their business and even maybe being a bit stingy about how they give. Lord, I pray for revelation about how, how to give in a way that honors you, mighty God. I pray for multiplication to take place in this place, Jesus. Father, I pray that whatever your children are doing that, 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 that they believe is, is based on the call that you have placed on their lives, God, that you bless the work of their hands and that you make them fruitful and multiply, mighty God. May they be examples of your grace and your mercies to the world, Father God. May, that, may even the government of Cayman, Jesus. Father God, I pray that this place will be a, a place where they come to for advice, Father God. Where they come for prayer, mighty God. Jesus, I, 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 I release the kingmaker anointing, Father God, over this atmosphere. I, re I release the kingmaker anointing that you have given me over this atmosphere right now, Jesus. That government, members of government will come to this house for advice. They will come because they want to hear, thus say the Lord. And Jesus, I thank you that your people, that we will not turn to the left or to the right. And God, for those of us who, who have already maybe made some choices that are not of you, where our hands are unclean, Jesus, I pray for a washing to happen, mighty God. And Father God, where people do not listen, where they do not Father God, take heed to your word. May there be an unveiling, Jesus. May we see the gifts of the Spirit operate full flow in this house, mighty God. Father God, they will read about us, Lord. Because we are the ones who decide, Father God, that we would rather die than not do your will, mighty God. We are the ones that will sound like Esther, Father God, and say, if I perish, I perish. Father, let our desire to do your will become greater than anything else in our lives. Father, we honor you and we praise you. If you're in the house this morning and you don't know Jesus or you want prayer, the altar is open. In your group, we don't force anyone to come up. We set the table. The word of the Lord says that the Spirit of God draws all men unto him.